When times grow dark and life grows mean, the hardest times we've ever seen. When darkness overwhelms the dawn, can we find strength to carry on? When high winds tear down what we've built, do we give in to blame and guilt? Or work and fight as we've done? Our first group is Kevin Camps, uh, who is with Beyond Nuclear. And uh, Kevin specializes in the risks of high-level radioactive waste management and transportation, as well as those of proposed new and age-degraded existing reactors, decommissioning, Congress Watch, and resisting federal and state subsidies for the nuclear power industry. A particular focus for the past few years has been fighting consolidated interim storage facilities, as several speakers have mentioned, currently targeted at New Mexico and Texas. But he continues his work as resistance to the Yucca Mountain dump, as Leona mentioned, uh, targeted at Western Shoshone land in Nevada which he's been doing for three decades. Wow, that's a long time, Kevin. And Kevin serves as a board of directors, a board of directors member for Don't Waste Michigan Contamination, uh, where he focuses, oh, I'm sorry, a board of directors member for Don't Waste Michigan and an advisory board member for Citizens for Alternatives to Chemical Contamination, where he focuses on reactor, radioactive waste, and other nuclear risks to the Great Lakes that are precious to all of us. Kevin. Thanks, Catherine. It's a real honor to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And speaking of stolen lands, I am speaking to you from Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is my hometown. Anishinaabe land, specifically Gun Lake Pot Potawatomi, Pokagon Potawatomi, Grand River, Odawa. So um, before I forget, I wanted to mention another July 16th, day of infamy, and that is that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission began the Holtec licensing proceeding on July 16th, 2018. And I think given what Leona shared about Church Rock and about Trinity, that it just shows the NRC's uh, cluelessness at best, and I think more accurately, their, their ghoulish tone deafness that we have to deal with all the time on many issues. And regarding that question about resolutions, if individuals can sign, I just wanted to mention that one of our ways that we broke records on public comments in the earlier environmental scoping stage of both Holtec New Mexico and Waste Control Specialist Texas were the web forms that NEARS and Food and Water Watch and Public Citizen circulated. So we really need to get those circulating because we generated tens of thousands of comments that way in the earlier stage. So we need to do that again this time and break those records. So the main issue I'm gonna talk about, and I'm gonna to try to share my screen, and I'm gonna to try to make my PowerPoint um, viewable right here, is nuclear waste transportation. And I have way too many slides, so I'm gonna fly through, and I'm going to just hit the high points and skip the rest. So that's our slogan that we've used for a long time, Mobile Chernobyl. Thank you to Michael Marriott and to Nears for not just great slogans, but great stickers, as you can see. <laughs> and uh, my main point is whether this waste, this high level radioactive waste is bound for consolidated interim storage sites. And this photo shows Marjean Bull Creek of the Skull Valley Goshutes, the main opponent to the dump that targeted their reservation in Utah Holtec's previous attempt at this uh, kind of scheme, or whether it's headed to Western Shoshone Indian land at Yucca Mountain. And there you see the Western face of Yucca uh, through a framework of a traditional sweat lodge. Um, this is going to be unprecedented numbers of shipments through most states in the lower 48. And this is a photo from National Geographic. It's actually infrared shows the thermal heat coming off an actual shipment. 
but it gives you some idea that invisible things are emitted by these shipments, and that includes gamma and neutron radiation, which are hazardous, and I'll talk more about. So here's a photo on the left of an actual train-sized cask, and on the right, a cross-section to show you the different layers. So the industry and its propagandists like to talk about how robust these containers are, and I guess they are, but the question is, are they robust enough to survive real-world accidents? And that's an important question that we have to address. So unlike pro-nuclear, pro yucca dump members of Congress, like retired Senator Carl Levin from Michigan, there is no magic wand that can just teleport the waste out to Nevada, New Mexico, Texas. In that sense, we all live in these states because we live along the transportation lines that are gonna bring these wastes through our communities. So what are the risks? Uh, crashes, fires, drops, underwater submersions, intentional attacks. And here's another great question from Nears. And actually every time there's a derailment, every time a bomb train explodes, every time there's a fire, the question needs to be asked, what if this had been a radioactive waste transport? So there have been a lot of deceptions over the decades. The fire test that was conducted at Sandia they like to talk about how great it went for the first 30 minutes, which is the design criteria at a relatively low temperature, 1,475 degrees Fahrenheit. By way of comparison, diesel fuel burns at 1,800 degrees. But they didn't want to talk about what happened just a few minutes after 30 minutes, which was the lead radiation shielding began to melt and spurt out and even vaporize. What that would mean specifically is that the radiation shielding is gone. Now the dose rates are gonna be much higher for emergency responders, for innocent passersby, for people who live nearby. And this is another deception that came out of the Sandia tests of the 1970s. Dr. Reznikoff, who was mentioned earlier, points out that that truck that was set on the tracks to be hit by that train was actually jacked up higher than it would have been normally. And so what this really represented as dramatic as the video was, was a glancing blow. The, the sheet metal on the nose of the train is what hit that dummy canister, not the, the main body of the train, which is further down below. So a lot of deceptions and propaganda about how safe it all is. These containers really have not been tested. They literally have not been tested at full scale. The best that's been done is computer simulations and scale models. So this is another real world accident that these containers had better be ready to meet. This is Interstate 40 in Oklahoma and the interesting timing of this accident was it happened just before the big votes, specifically in the U.S. Senate on Yucca back in 2002 that overrode Nevada's veto. So if a container on a truck had hit the bridge abutment, would it have survived? Would it have survived? That's a lot more than a 30-foot drop there. And what if uh, it went into the river? Would it survive the submersion? Because one of the risks of submersion is there's enough fissile material in the waste uranium-235, plutonium-239, that if water comes in, it could spark a chain reaction in the waste if a critical mass is formed. And that could be an emergency um, responder's suicide if they try to respond to that. So more real-world accidents, falls off overpasses, sinking of barges. I'm always happy when we get political cartoons. This came, of a, came out of our campaign in New York to stop high-level radioactive liquid waste shipments. And this was in the Buffalo newspaper. Again, intentional attacks are a concern. So this is another real-world fire in Baltimore, a downtown train tunnel that burned for three days for the first 24 hours at about 15, at 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, higher than the design criteria temperature, much longer than 30 minutes. And actually, Dr. Reznikoff commissioned by the State Agency for Nuclear Projects in Nevada, looked at that, put a hypothetical Holtec container in that fire that took place in July of 2001. And what he found was the container would have failed, it would have breached, it would have released a fraction of its contents. But depending on how long people stayed in the contaminated areas of downtown Baltimore, the latent cancer fatalities would have numbered between eight people dying up to 32,000 for people who lived in that contamination for a lifetime over a 50-year dose. 
So that is 10 times the 9-11 attacks to give you some idea what a single container of this waste could do to a city or an agricultural area. Chicago would be very hard hit no matter if the dump were in Nevada, New Mexico, or Texas. That far east, it doesn't matter. The routes are going to be similar to identical. And all of those towns in the Chicago land area would be directly crossed by road or rail shipments. So this just shows where in the human body these radionuclides will go once they escape into the environment and people eat them or drink them or inhale them or otherwise ingest them as through wounds. This is an image of an ape lung cell with a plutonium um, molecule in it. And you can see the tracks of damage that this speck of plutonium is causing in ape lung tissue. This is a microscopic photograph. So this is radioactive Russian roulette on the roads, rails, and waterways. And look who's going to be in charge of it. The Department of Energy is infamous for screwing up all the time in every way possible. And the industry is just as bad as the DOE. So it's not, it doesn't just take an accident. Routine shipments, incident-free shipments are still mobile, mobile x-ray machines that can't be turned off in terms of gamma and neutron emissions. So you can see the penetrating power of neutrons. You can see the penetrating power of gamma. The NRC allows a certain level of dose rate to come off of these shipments. At six feet away, it is 10 millirem per hour. That's one to two chest x-rays per hour. And right at the surface of the container, so especially of concern to workers and inspectors and security, it's up to 200 millirem per hour, 10 times. So that's 10 to 20 x-rays per hour coming off by permission of the NRC. And a problem that's been seen with Orano or Arriva of France in their own shipments back in France was an epidemic of beyond permissible, higher than allowable dose rates because of external contamination. So this is hundreds of shipments. The average excess was 500 times permissible. Now we're talking 500 to 1,000 chest x-rays per hour at a distance of six feet. In one case, it was 3,300 times permissible. The same company involved in the Texas proposal. So here's our mock nuke waste cask, another phrase, slogan from NEARS. And we hauled that thing across the country several times, educating, activating, one way of stopping these dumps. This is uh, Senator Dick Durbin, long-serving assistant leader of the Democrats in the US Senate at the 4th of July parade. Dave Kraft took the photo. This is the Missouri State Capitol in Jefferson City. This is Dee DeRigo and Erica Gray, I believe, causing trouble at the NRC headquarters. This is uh, action at FERC. I just liked uh, the Statue of Liberty taking part in that one. Uh, I think that might be the chairman of the nearest board of directors getting in a paddy wagon right there, Chris Williams uh, at Vermont Yankee in 2012, a successful shutdown campaign that um, was a tremendous grassroots victory. It's the only solution for high level radioactive waste, any good solution, don't make it in the first place. So floating Fukushima's, the barred shipments, beware of fire, heavy haul truck shipments have their own risks. This is a successful campaign. Hats off to the Mohawk of Quebec who drove the final nail in the coffin of these proposed radioactive steam generator shipments from Bruce Nuclear, Ontario to Sweden, which would have passed this close to downtown Detroit on the river if they had gone forward. More trouble at NRC headquarters, good trouble. There's that shipment route over to Sweden across the ocean. These were the bozos behind the proposal and just their words on the floor of the Canadian Parliament days before Fukushima began, calling us fear mongers who were just hung up on Chernobyl. So another way to stop these things is research and education and um, Dr. Gordon Edwards of Montreal won a Nuclear Free Future Award for his education in the anti-nuclear movement over decades. And again, the, the Mohawks of Quebec said those shipments are not coming through, and that put an end to them right there. So another slogan is dirty bombs on wheels, the threat of terrorist attacks. This is a mobile anti-tank missile um, system. 
something like 500 of these tow missiles went missing in Syria on a single day when ISIS overran a, uh, a rebel stronghold and nobody knows for sure where those weapons went afterwards. This is a map put out by the state of Nevada 20 years ago showing the shipment routes to Yucca Mountain, Nevada. So you can see how many states up to 45 are impacted. This is a more recent map based on the 2008 DOE study of Yucca. Nevada made it more user-friendly with shipment numbers per state. We have a lot more information about Yucca because waste control specialists and Holtec and the NRC have been so secretive. And why? Because that's how we got a lot of support across the country against Yucca, was getting those routes out. So this shows the low-level waste burial at waste control specialists. It's putting the Oglala at risk. This is a map that Seed Coalition and Public Citizen hammered out because of the secrecy of the companies and the NRC. Terry Lodge, who's the legal counsel for Don't Waste Michigan and others, a seven-group coalition, which includes NISG. These are the legal counsel for Beyond Nuclear, Diane Curran and Mindy Goldstein, and both um, Terry and now our legal counsel are before the second highest court in the land the DC Circuit Court of Appeals on the whole tech matter, soon to be joined by Sierra Club, Wally Taylor. And as everybody's been saying, waste control specialists is six to eight weeks behind whole tech. Speaking of resolutions, I just find it really inspiring that Bev Fernandez and her husband, Frank, their group is called Stop the Great Lakes Nuclear Dump. They generated 250 resolutions. Wow. The population of those jurisdictions is 24 million people. It was of huge help in educating and activating. And it set it up for the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation who voted no earlier this year by an 86% to 14% margin. And that dud, deep underground dump, was stopped on the Lake Huron shoreline. But the fight continues because now they've proposed a high level radioactive waste dump 30 miles inland. And they're not asking the Saugeen Ojibwe what they think about it this time. So as is often the case, Native American leadership, Native American woman leadership in stopping these dumps. Grace Thorpe, uh, a former member of the NEARS board who passed on some years ago, not only stopped the consolidated interim storage targeted at her reservation in Oklahoma, but then went on the road and helped others like Rufina Marie Laws in Southeast New Mexico to stop these CISs. Some 60 tribes stopped CISs targeted at them in the past. Winona Lundu and Out of the Earth, as well as Indigenous Environmental Network, were essential to those victories. We could not have done it without them. And again, Native leadership now on the environmental justice front. So Yucca, we have to keep an eye on. Every once in a while, one of those 12 toes on the Yucca zombie will twitch because uh, these clowns on Capitol Hill keep pushing for the Yucca dump. They're open to CIS. Luckily, Shimkus is retiring. We'll see if Upton can be retired involuntarily come November. Mm -hmm. This is them taking a tour of Yucca Mountain at a cost of $15,000 to taxpayers every time they open up this closed dump for congressional tours. So whistleblowers are essential. Oscar Sharani questioned the structural integrity of full tax sitting still, let alone going 60 miles per hour down the roads and rails. Dr. Landsman from NRC compared NRC's thinking to NASA's that led to space shuttles hitting the ground. In Germany, they just shut the shipments down. This was the heartbeat of the German anti-nuclear movement for decades, which now will be shutting down the last reactors in Germany by 2022. Uh, watchdogging and institutional memory, Kay Dry, who's president of the Beyond Nuclear Board, um, she and I wrote an article about the Three Mile, Isle, Three Mile Island meltdown transports that went through St. Louis involving a number of incidents. So that's the end of the slideshow. Real quick, I wanna show, I know I'm over time already, I wanna show some of these images because it brings it up to date. Waste control specialists said they could use any mainline rail in the country for these shipments. This is the only map in the Holtec license application. It accounts for a grand total of four reactors in the country, one at Maine Yankee, three at San Onofre, California, and I really want to call your attention to that dark green line. That means that those areas of Texas and Oklahoma are going to get hit coming and going 
And that gets to the bottom of how nonsensical uh, CIS is. It multiplies transport risks. And that light green line shows that they are assuming that Yucca is the dump, which of course violates the treaty with the Western Shoshone. And I just like this um, 20 year old um, document from Public Citizen because it shows that the real world conditions these containers could face on the roads and rails and waterways are much worse than what NRC is um, designing or requiring them to be designed for. So you got the yucca routes, you got um, bow ups of cities like New York City and Newark, New Jersey. The purple is rail, the red is truck. Sorry for the orientation, but you can see that the, the width of New York is hit by these, um, these shipment routes. These are the congressional districts in New York that would be impacted. These are the shipment numbers bound for Yucca, 827 train shipments through New York, 657 truck shipments. Remember that Yucca is 70,000 metric tons. Um, Holtec is two and a half times that, and waste control specialists half again. I wanted to show this map to show the EJ burden that New Mexico has already suffered, nuclear, fossil fuels. This is a uh, Sample comments, I know NISG, NIRS, Seed Coalition are circulating sample comments you can use in both proceedings. Very low level waste, NIRS has an action alert. You can write NRC, they're doing a webinar on July 15th. Uh, barge shipments impacting New York, uh, down the Hudson River past Manhattan is under consideration. Really insane. And again, as Leona showed, this is tomorrow night. Please join in that if you can. And this is where to write to the NRC on the very low level waste. We could talk more about that during um, Q&A. Thanks. We're going to move on to the third and final speaker of our uh, special support speakers and experts. And this is Tim Judson. And I'm sure you all know Tim. And uh, he is the executive director of NIRS, Nuclear Information Resource Service, and has been working on these issues for a very long time. Almost anything you want to know about nuclear energy, go to the website, nears.org, and you can find answers. The same goes for beyondnuclear.org. Uh, Tim works both nationally and internationally. In fact, uh, he was at, I was as I saw him, in Paris in 2015 for the UN Climate Talks and was organizing international events, rallies against nuclear issues. So Tim works both locally, nationally, and internationally. And uh, Tim, you also introduced me to Leona back in 2016 in the Philadelphia Energy March, remember? Uh, Leona, yeah. Okay, so Tim, take it away. Yeah, well, I actually don't have a whole lot to add to uh, to what all, to all the terrific presentations that have happened earlier this evening. Um, you know, what I, I think the one reflection that I would offer um, is that you know we're, this this issue with the with the consolidated interim storage sites um, proposed for New Mexico and Texas, um, and the environmental racism that's involved in um, in these projects, these proposed projects, um, is really you know a stark indicator of the way in which the, the, the nuclear industry, um, just like a number of other industries, um, it's, really, the, the, it's really built on a foundation of trafficking and environmental racism and environmental injustice. Um, and, you know, when we think about the issue of environmental racism, um, you know, the environmental racism doesn't protect the environment. It actually, it actually ensures that the environment is damaged by targeting uh, populations and communities that, that, that have less ability to fight back against against the kind of injustice that's that, that's created by these by, by these polluting industries, and so in fact, you know, I'm actually a member of the of the U.S. Climate Action Network, where one of our mottos is justice first, and um, and you know we really need to um, to take seriously the um, the idea that that's really I think come to the fore over the last couple of months between the COVID pandemic and the and the protests for racial justice after the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others. Um, that you know it, injustice doesn't protect our country and it doesn't it doesn't protect our environment and we need to put justice first um, because you know if we all had to share the burden of the choices that we make about our about energy and the environment and, and our and, and other things then. We're gonna we're gonna all have to make better choices, 
And I think that's really what, and I think that's really what this issue brings to the fore. And I think, you know, the, the other aspect of this is that, you know, in many ways, environmental racism is intended to sort of cover up a problem and make sure that the people of color and poor people um, are the ones that are most impacted. Um, but in fact, in this particular case, um, the environmental racism that's involved in citing these CIS facilities in, you know, in Hispanic communities in New Mexico and Texas, which is the only places that they could reasonably have a chance of, of, of making these projects, you know, able to be built, um, is that it's the, the transportation of this waste, as we saw with those transport maps, is going to affect the entire country. Every, just about every part of the country is going to be impacted with, with immense risk as a result of the environmental racism of citing these, these nuclear waste facilities um, in these Hispanic communities um, that don't deserve it and that, um, and, and, that, and that don't want it. And so that's, I think, really, I think what we sort of need to sort of take in at a deep level is that, um, is that environmental racism um, is a way of ensuring that, um, that, 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 that we poison our environment and, you know, and, and that certain people are going to be more impacted as a result of that. Um, so with that said, what I, what I wanted to do was just highlight um, the, the, the opportunities to take action on these issues. And so I'm going to do a screen share so that you can kind of see what I'm referring to. But there's, there's you know, essentially um, three major actions that need to be taken right now. Um, first and most importantly are um, to submit comments on these uh, draft environmental impact statements uh, for the Holtec and, and WCS uh, nuclear waste storage facilities. Um, and you can, if you go to our, if you go to NIRS's website, which is www.nirs.org, and um, I'm sharing that screen right now. If you go to uh, nirs.org and you click on Action Center in the top left, and then Alerts, um, you will find uh, you'll be able to access all of these opportunities to take action that I'm talking about, ex with the exception of um, the uh, the NRC webinar happening tomorrow. Uh, which is prominently displayed on Beyond Nuclear's website, um, where you can act, where, where you can find out how to how to how to get on that webinar and make a comment there. Um, but in any case, um, you know you can uh, take action to submit comments on both the Holtec and WC WCS uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, nuclear waste storage sites um, by clicking on one of these the, uh, one of our actions here that references them. Um, such as say no to hauling nuclear waste across the country. Um, that'll take you to the link where you can um, submit a comment, not just to NRC on both of these uh, sites simultaneously, but also to send the same message to your Congress members, because really we need to also be putting political pressure on the NRC from Congress in order to defeat these projects. Um, and then the other, the other issue, which, um, which Michelle referred to was this, this, uh, you know, a proposal by NRC to allow nuclear waste to be dumped in regular landfills. Um, there's uh, going to be, so we're, we're also submitting, we're also creating uh, an opportunity for people to submit comments on that through our website. Um, no nuclear, and you can find this on our website, that same page uh, with the action alerts, no nuclear waste in our landfills. Um, that will also send the same message uh, to, your, to your Congress members as well as the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, and then, um, as uh, was referred to, if you want to learn more about that issue, next Wednesday at 8 o'clock, July 15th, 8, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, and the other times in between, uh, we're going to be having a telebriefing um, about that topic um, so that people can learn more about it and learn, how, and learn more about how to take action. Um, and that's, that's an event called Coming Soon to Your Local Landfill, Nuclear Waste Courtesy of the, courtesy of the NRC. Um, and you can register for that event and, and get the information about uh, how to call in for that telebriefing um, on, on this webpage as well.